Good morning. Today is March 8th. I'll call to order the meeting of the Story County Board of Supervisors. Please stand if you're able and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to adopt today's agenda? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Head and side. Aye. Basil, aye. Now it's time for public comment number one. This comment period is for the public to address topics on today's agenda. If you'd like to make public comment, please step forward to the table or uh, raise your hand on Zoom. If you're on the phone, you can use star nine. Seeing no one will close public comment number one and move on to agency reports. We have Lutheran services in um, in Iowa annual report. Melissa. Melissa. Hello, can you hear me? You can. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Um, so Alyssa Barton, I'm the service coordinator with Lutheran Services in Iowa, um, and I am with our crisis child care program. Welcome. Um, are there are there highlights you would like to share with us from from your report? Yeah, so um, for the report, just some things we wanted to kind of point out. Um, so crisis childcare for anybody who doesn't know um, is we um, try to contract with in home registered daycare providers. Um, once we have those, then we have a phone line that anybody can call 24 seven in Story County. if They're experiencing a crisis and need somewhere safe to place their children under the age of 12. Um, so then we can make the connection with an in-home provider, get that situated. They can deal with whatever they have to deal with. The kids are in a safe space. Um, so we've been doing this. Um, the biggest challenges that we faced um, are, of course, with COVID um, and dealing with Story County continuing to be a child care desert, um, which basically means there's more kids being born and then there are child care spots, um, which really put us um, in a really hard position because we need to gain more providers right now. Um, unfortunately, the providers in Story County, they're at max capacity. Um, so, and if they do get a spot open, it's taken right away. Um, so that doesn't leave us space following DHS regulations with ratio in order to place any outside children in their care. Um, COVID then kind of put a damper on that because registered daycare providers, they have it in their contracts that they you know, get so many vacation days a year, but then if they have an outbreak in their home, they have to shut down. So then they were kind of skeptical with bringing outside kids in. So we kind of had to pause services a little bit during that period. Um, things have gotten, you know, a lot better with that situation, um, but we still just don't have enough spots to place these kids. We are still getting calls um to place children we did so far this fiscal year we have um, we were able to place one family a mom with a little three-year-old boy um we helped her out and was, we're actually able to place her thankfully it was a weekend um so we did have space so oddly enough we're one of those services where weekends and nights are actually easier for us <laughs> to place children than during the day unfortunately we're getting calls for most people during the day. Um, so if they would just, you know, have their crises and on the nights and weekends, we'd be set. But um, that again, of course, is out of our control. We have tried to make some changes. Um, we did get approval to, instead of just having registered in-home daycare providers, um, we have opened it up to registered foster care providers. Um, unfortunately, that is also a really tough spot to be in right now because they're very short for foster care families, um, but we do have that as, as, as an option. Um, we've also tried to raise the wage from $3.50 an hour to $5 an hour. That did um, kind of get out to providers and we did have people reach out to us. Unfortunately, they weren't in Story County, um, the providers that were interested in it, so we couldn't contract with them. So. We're going to try again and make, you know, another big 
announcement of the increase in rage here. Maybe hopefully once it gets a little warmer and people are more comfortable with letting other people inside their home. Um, so those are just kind of the challenges we've been facing and what we've tried to do to overcome that. Um, right now we're also in the works of, we had one of our providers, um, every registered in-home provider, they are able to have like a sub that is able to come. Like if they had to go to a doctor appointment, they have somebody that um, they've submitted, you know, their background checks and all of that, that's able to kind of step in if they need to step away. Um, and she actually asked if her sub was able to be a registered um, provider with us. Um, so we're working with our CQI and compliance to see if that, you know, would be a viable option since um, they're not fully registered. Um, they just don't have some of those extra trainings, but maybe if we could make them an employee rather than just contract with them, we could get past some of those um, obstacles. So that's kind of where we're in the process now. So we're trying to open it up to gain more providers in the most creative ways we can think of. Um, we just gotta get those people in. So that's kind of where we're at with crisis childcare. Uh, Alyssa, this is Lisa. Uh, mm -hmm. You made a comment that um, you had folks interested, but they were not from Story County. So I know in the past for crisis child care, they contracted with providers that were like in Boone County. So they're out of county, but the, the kids of, when they were placed could be billed under Story County because they were Story County kids. You, you know, you're helping a Story County family. It's just that mm -hmm. the providers just happen to be out of county. Are you, have you gone away from that or? We do still um, contract with Boone County because we do have funding in Boone County. Um, but you know, we, if it's a Boone County person, we just can't use this funding for it. Um, unfortunately, the counties that we got, one was um, Marshalltown. Um, so that's, it's a pretty far distance. Um, and then one was um, Johnson County. Okay. So, I mean, Marshalltown wouldn't be awful, but that's a really long drive for a little one. And I don't, you know, we could make it an option um, if we wanted to go back and look at that, but I, I'm not sure parents, parents would want their kids that far away, especially if it's for like a short amount of time. Um, but that would be an option. The Johnston one was obviously not now because that's like three hours away, but. No, but I'm and if you're if you're in lack of child care providers that you have requests for placements, particularly like the one that you just had that were a weekend, maybe Marshalltown or wherever would be but not I'm not advocating for Johnson County, but maybe somewhere else that might be closer mm -hmm. that they have that somebody's in need. Just throwing out that as an option. Yeah, right, right. No, makes sense. Um, Alyssa, just wondering how closely you work with um, uh, CCRNR. Yeah, they have all of our information. Um, we do work closely with them. And so anytime they do get a new provider, their provider gets our information. Um, we've put our information in packets whenever they do trainings um, for those new providers. Um, that hasn't really worked out to get any referrals from those. Um, most of our provider referrals have come from like social media. That valuable service. I know from having worked at LFI previously and I mean the crisis child care program, families are very appreciative. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. Perfect, perfect. Thank you guys. Moving on to consideration of minutes. We have a motion to approve the minutes from March 1st. So moved. They all said. Moved and seconded. Heads. Aye. Work it. Aye. Basil, aye. Consideration of personnel actions. I move to approve the personnel actions. Section. Moved and seconded. Work it. Aye. Heads. Aye. Basil, aye. Uh, consent agenda. Motion to approve consent agenda. Uh, we will approve a consent agenda as a consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Pedens. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Basil. Aye. 
Um, moving on to a uh, public hearing item. We have consideration of resolution 22-64 FY23 maximum property tax dollars. It's working, I heard it wasn't. Yep, it's working. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. About three years ago, the legislature uh, passed Senate File 634, which one of the aspects of it was to make it um, more, have an additional public notice regarding um, the request or the budget and the tax askings. Um, I, I've stated this before and I'll say it again. I don't think it's clarified anything for anybody. However, um, it required, it, it had added a second public hearing um, it also extended our, our budget deadline as far as March 31st now instead of March 15th. This resolution must pass by a supermajority in order to um, move forward with our budget as proposed. Um, this was published on 224 as required for the public hearing today. The uh, maximum is only um, looked at for the general general supplemental, rural and rural supplemental. There are other levies that the board has in the past, mental health, not this year, um, and debt service. So there's no comparison of apples to apples, actually. Uh, one thing to note is the proposed budget we're putting together is actually going, the levy rate is actually going down by 66 cents. So, so despite the fact that this says we're increasing taxes, we're increasing tax assets tax askings because of the valuations. Um, the actual uh, rural fund is going down 2.61% according to the public publication that we've provided. So. <clears throat> Do you have any questions for me? How much is rural going down again? So rural is going from $3.9 million worth, or three point five. 3.593 to 3.5 tax dollars. It's actually going down 66 cents. Uh, okay, I will open public hearing if anyone would like to make comment on maximum property tax dollars, you can step forward to the table, raise your hand on Zoom. No one, we will close uh, public hearing. I move for um, approval of resolution number 22-64, approving the FY23 maximum property tax dollars. Second. Moved and seconded. Work in. All right. Head to the side. Hazel, aye. Additional items. We have consideration of the 2022 communications plan. I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, good morning. Good morning. The, I'm a little bit late. The owl is running away. Um, a little bit late coming to the board this year with the communication plan. Generally, we, we like to bring this in early January, um, but scheduling just was not, not friendly this year um, with different, different um, schedules. So um, we're here. Uh, just a few brief comments on what the communication plan in is, and then I'll go through it um, on a high level and then answer any questions. Um, the communications plan has been something that the Board of Superv Supervisors has been taking action on considering since 2014, um, which doesn't seem that long ago, but um, it's now we're well in eight years into it. Um, it, seems, it serves as the, as the general blueprint that Story County uses 
um, to communicate timely, openly, and proactively um, with a goal to communicate what we know when we know it um, openly and in ways that are really easier to access and understand rather than you using um, just lingo we all tend to use time to time. Um, have it be proactive rather than reactive to the best of our abilities. Um, we all know over the past couple of years with COVID and derecho and, and other events has been challenging at times, um, but it really has helped us to look at different strategies that can help us get messaging out and, and involve the, the public in the discussions that are ongoing. Zoom is a, is a great example of being able to involve the public in, in those types of meetings. Um, the draft that is before you today does look a little bit different. Just want to touch on that for a moment. Um, it just um, simplified it a little bit more, maybe made it a little bit easier to use rather than um, so heavy in verbiage. Um, the goals and targeted audiences are mostly the same as were in place in 2014, with some tweaking, um, but there are five goals. Uh, this year, they're the same as last year's. Um, same with the targeted audiences. And there are six targeted audiences. To go along with the goals, there are strategies with action steps. And um, as we get into the plan, um, we'll, we'll discuss those, specifically the action steps. Um, no changes are proposed to the goal statements or, or the strategies. Um, as I said, again, it's a blueprint, um, really kind of general in approach. Um, there is some specificity in the action steps. And, and in a lot of those cases, those action steps are actually built into my work program um, and guide some of my, and as well as Bryce's um, work as we go forward throughout the calendar year. Um, but it does extend beyond that. You'll see things like wellness initiatives. Um, that's something that Story County collectively does um, that just I'm involved in, Bryce is involved in, but it's just not specific to us. Are there any questions on just a high level overview? Hearing none. Um, I was just going to go through and highlight for the board the changes from last time. So under the first goal, which is transparency and accessibility through, throughout the duration of projects and issues in Story County, um, the, the first sheet that addresses that, there are no changes. I just want to touch on the annual report. Um, I think it is appropriate that we move that annual report to fiscal year basis rather than calendar year. Um, that will allow us to start doing some trends analysis that we've not had. And that may, our annual report is not truly an annual report. Um, so that is, I mean, there's no change, just that's a, that's a, a point I want to make. Um, the second page that deals with that goal, um, there are a few um, new strategies or action steps. Um, just quickly, bi-weekly or monthly blog posts to the website. So as we get the website refresh done, we'll flush that out. Um, incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And then um, compiling a Story County informational booklet that really gives like a historical perspective of Story County. Um, we found some files and boxes that would be fun to catalog. And then um, we have a, a big anniversary coming up here that this might help us start to prepare for that too. Um, I can't say that anniversary, so I'm not gonna try. Yeah, this tongue twister for me. Um, the other change on that page is really how we've, um, we've revised the language dealing with the mission statement. The past couple of iterations have been the developing, the fleshing out of the mission statement. This is really um, going the next step with the implementation and engaging employment. And engaging employees in the deployment of the mission statement. Are there any questions on that first goal? The next goal is sharing the Story County vision with general public and decision makers. Um, that first page and under this goal, um, there are three new action steps, but I do want to just touch on, there's one revision as well, and that is um, when it talks about assisting human resources with onboarding recruitment materials, um, we add an office department recognition events. It's something we've been doing, so we wanted to, to reflect past practice in here. <coughs> Pardon me, the new ones um, are partnering with local communities to publish content in newsletters. 
As the board knows, you've signed contracts with both Gilbert and the city of Nevada, and they were continuing to look at other opportunities with other communities throughout Story County. Um, the next one is having an annual work session to really discuss communication and outreach. I, I think that'd be very beneficial to start looking at in November, especially as we're starting to develop a budget um, or collectively for Story County. That will then set the stage um, to really delve into what was working this year, what was not working. Um, this year might be a little bit shortened, but um, it's something I'd like to start doing. And then lastly, developing a universal social, social, social media branding, um, just to be consistent with our messaging. Do you have more questions as we go along? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be. Okay. Partnering with local communities to publish content in newsletters. Have you ever talked to Ames about having maybe a county, a little bit about the county in your newsletter? I have not, but we can. Well, yeah. I think it makes sense because we, we sometimes we focus on the smaller, we need to focus on, on the other communities. Yeah. But Ames is two thirds of the population, and Ames residents are really impacted by things that go on in the county. And I just always wondered why we didn't maybe have uh, some way to get some of this into that news. But yeah, I will reach out to, I would imagine it would be Susan. And yeah, and like I said, we are. Um, that's an evolving strategy or action step too. I, I mean, I've been really pleased with how we've gone thus far with Nevada and Gilbert too. So every opportunity we can um, will help us maximize the messaging. Yeah, and I think well, Nevada kind of stepping forward and saying we need to do mm -hmm. this was a really good thing for us working on it. So yeah. I would think some of the other smaller communities as well um, might be ones where we could just have a page or you know front back. And I know a lot of times they're looking for filler too, and so it would help right. them as well as us. Oh, it's always been really good about publishing. They have, yeah. Yeah. they have even before we had a formal oh, yes. formal agreement. Yeah, yeah, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, next is the next goal is improving communications between the Board of Supervisors and our constituents. Um, a couple of new strategies and action steps in this one. I keep on calling strategy action steps. Um, on the first page under this goal is a mass mailing with content related to the county's website and social media pages. Um, this would be something we would work with um, either Treasurer Rasmussen or um, Actually, it would probably be more likely because this is not the year that assessment notices go out um, full scale to all property owners in Story County, um, except for Ames, of course. Um, so we would just as a simple sheet that Bryce has developed, Supervisor Merkin has been involved with this. Just here's what our website is. Here are our web social media. Here's how you can follow us. Um, I think if we time it appropriately with the refresh too, it'd be a great way to get information out there. Um, that's like very specific, but you see a similar one on the next page too. And that's just reviewing, researching potential costs for countywide mailings. It's kind of looking at a, a broader level of, okay, if we um, divide the county into quadrants, how much would it be to do a a uh, countywide mailing to the northwest corner of uh, Quadro and Story County. It could make some estimations. I don't have any idea. This is actually delving in and, and finding out the devil in the details in that. Um, the other new one is a calendar publication. Um, Sandra King brought this idea to, to us. Um, it's just a, a, a calendar for Story County to, for us to release to the general public. We will be targeting 2023 for release. Um, this is really the devil is in the details to be developed. And we have not done any research up until this point other than some pre preliminary, um, preliminary budget figures, but even those are very high level. We want to make sure that the board understood the concept and let's, let's go on it before we did too much homework on it. Any questions on those? I'm losing my voice. Um, you're suggesting we do quadrant meetings again? It is in here. It is. Um, but that was just divine. That what I was talking about with the mailing too was if we targeted 
different areas of the county, knowing how much the mailings would be in different areas of the county. But um, it is a biannual, biannual quadrant meeting to the Board of Supervisors, local elected officials, and members of the public. Um, we've had some issues with that in the past on attendance. Um, as the board well knows, well, I don't think you've been involved in any of them. I'm not sure you have either, but um, in a lot of cases, county staff and elected officials have outnumbered the members of the public there. Um, but we've also done some new things since then, since we did it last. So I'd like to delve into a little bit, see if it's an option to look at. Plan it with uh, local city council mm -hmm. members and just you want planning rather than just be a show and tell. Here's what the yeah. county's doing. I like, I mean, I attended some yeah. in 2018 and I attended one that was a couple that were really well attended. One where I was, I was not a supervisor yet, I was the only member of the public. Yeah. And it was in a large community. Really. So yeah. I think if we, instead of just doing it and say, hey, we're going to be here, we coordinate it. And we do some publicity to get more members of the public to come. You know, maybe think about what it what it is that they're interested mm -hmm. in that we can highlight. There was definitely an evolution. They went from um, <clears throat> the intention of being one thing to turning into something totally different. I would like to return to the how they originally intended yeah. and carefully crafted it. I just got in on the tail end of yes. the evolution and I wasn't I thought we got better ones. Yeah. It was a lot of um, used staff time mm -hmm. too, unnecessarily if we weren't having a public there. Um any questions on, on those goal that goal? Um, next one is engaging in community through service and recognition is the goal. Um, just a, a couple new ones on here. One is new to the, the plan, but we've been doing it for a couple of years. So we, again, want to recognize that. That's Public Service Recognition Week in May. Um, we've done that now, I think, three years. Um, and then developing an annual proclamation schedule. Um, and you've seen some little work of that so far. Um, any questions on that goal? And the last goal is enhancing emergency response communications. And we don't have any proposed modifications to that um, from last year. Um, I do want to note on the targeted audiences, uh, we did go in under the other targeted audience, the other category, and update the some of the um, information. And I mean, the general public, I'm sorry, some of the census information to reflect the 2020 census. It did reference the previous census. So again, today's action is officially approving it, considering it and taking action on it. And a lot of the stuff we've already been doing, um, we'll continue to do, but allow us to start delving into some of the additional items. Yeah. In terms of quadrant um, meetings, you might be missing a really important segment of the county's population, which is Iowa State University. So maybe we could think about reaching out to student government, to groups, whatever there, and um, meet with them. It'd be a way to kind of let people know a little bit more about what county government is about. Yeah, I've, I've had a, a, I've exchanged a few emails with um, groups in my okay. state student government. Okay. Okay. So, okay, good. That's good. So, yeah. You're working. Yeah, I'm glad to know that. I think that's a good idea. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, quadrant meetings may not look like um, we may not be having it into four sections, and they never really were four sections. Mm -hmm. Um, it just was a nice way for us to label it and package it. So we'll we'll delve into that and look at scheduling, which is always a challenge too. Are there any more questions or comments? Definitely staff. Clear what what you're looking at doing and can follow on.
was not alone. Would you approve the 2022 communications? Yes. I'll move to approve the 2022 communications. Second. Seconded. Pettins. Aye. Again. Aye. Basil. Aye. Thanks, Leanne. And Bryce. Moving on to consideration of proposal from Rosalind Mackey Harris Architect. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, so this is in reference to the RFP we did for permanent front counter shields at this building, Animal Control Engineers Building. So we received two, one from Rosalind Mackey Harris, and they're out of Ames, and then OPN Architects out of Des Moines. Um, both firms are capable, competent firms. We've got experience with both of them. RMH has done some other projects for us and currently are doing the Justice Center HVAC project. OPN is currently doing our space needs assessment project. Um, so both are very familiar with our facilities and felt they both fully understood what our, uh, what our intent and the scope of the project was. Um, we did a uh, Melissa Wignell, John Eichholt, and I all independently scored both RFPs. Um, they had similar availability and timeline, staff, it's all qualified. So it, it basically come down to overall cost. As you can see, there was a, quite a difference in cost. So nothing glaring, it didn't felt like RMH missed anything. So I feel I'm comfortable with RMH doing the project. So that would be my recommendation is to go with RMH to, with the original design services as the initial contract and then handle any the construction services with an addendum to the original contract because that design services gives us cost estimating. So then that gives us the ability to if the project cost is much higher than we budgeted for. We don't have to. Mm. We don't have to pay them for the construction services. It would be handled at that time if we chose to move forward with it being a construction project. That we would just handle an addendum to the original contract and go ahead. So Mr. Wignell, you said that you didn't feel like RMH missed anything mm -hmm. looking at the cost difference. Was the other bidder like they were reading more into that? It's pretty dramatic. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Different. They both read through, and you know, we had a, a site. You know, we all I, on these types of projects, I always do a mandatory uh, site walkthrough so that we can talk about each location. And um, they were both there. They had questions answered. Reading through both proposals, that were very similarly worded. I, you know, I. Can't speculate why theirs was higher. You know, could nothing be, jumped out. Nothing jumped out. There wasn't anything, you know, because they both kind of went through the basics of what they understood the project was in their proposal. And there wasn't anything in OPMs that was they were including that would warrant a big discrepancy on the pricing. It could just be overall firm size too. Know that we um, a separate proposal from Rosalind Mackey Harris Architects for $15,850 for any design services for the installation of permanent front counter sheet. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, discussion and consideration of requests for full time and admin assistant. Two position in planning and development department. Why not? We'll see if I can make this clicker work. I've got a brief PowerPoint, just going over the memo. Um, and I just want to start off by saying, you know, I think this will cost about $34,000 more in a budget annually to have a full time position. And so I'm really hoping through the memo and through this brief PowerPoint summarizing it 
that I can show the benefits are going to be greater than those costs. Um, you know, we have an open position now, so I think there's an opportunity to fill it and create a smoother transition um, in terms of separating environmental health and the planning and development departments. And I think the need is only going to grow in the future. So it seems, you know, if it's not now, potentially inevitable down the road. Um, so this is our current department structure, environmental health has two environmental health specialists. We have two planners and, and, and an intern or two. And then we share an admin assistant. Um, previously, I think prior to 2013, there were um, two planners, a full-time admin assistant and a code enforcement officer in the planning and development department. Um, then environmental health had its own part-time admin assistant position. And there was some restructuring in 2013 and the planning and development department became just one planner and a director position and the departments merged offices and started to share an admin assistant. Um, since then, we've added a planner back to staff in 2017. Um, we took over floodplain management around that same time frame. Um, that was something that went with the department restructuring. Um, went to the county special projects manager and outreach manager, and then was transitioned back into our department. Um, on our current work program, we have the addition of a code enforcement officer, which would bring us to the previous staffing levels that we were at when we had a full-time administrative assistant position. Um, and we've been having discussions internally for a while about the need for an administrative assistant full-time for our department. Um, while it is a 50-50 position, planning does tend to take more of that position's time, which we've had to adjust with more Board of Health meetings with, with COVID-19, um, but generally we do. So I, I have compiled permitting data since 2011, and generally there's, there's an increase. Um, the administrative assistant handles zoning permits, but also all application intakes, so that's about Last year, that was 219 individual applications. Um, I'd really like to see their role in reviewing applications for completeness increase. Um, that would help out our planners. And then development cases are kind of all over the place. Um, but generally, there's been an increase with 2018, 2019, and 2020, and 2017 were really high years. Um, some unique duties that our admin assistant does are we have, there's, we have two boards that we staff. And so they're the reporting secretary for both of those boards. It includes minutes. Those minutes don't quite look like the board of supervisors minutes because the board of adjustments decisions can be appealed to court. Stephanie, our previous administrative assistant recently had to do some that were 14 pages long um, and included you know, all testimony. Um, some additional duties that if the position were full time, I would shift from myself and the planners include, you know, increasing review of permits during application intake. So, for instance, we got a permit in for a deck this week and the applicant applied for one deck, paid for one deck, and then Andrea opened the site plan and it showed two decks. And so if the admin assistant position, you know, could look at the site plan and say, oh, hey, that matches up with what they'd have applied for, that would save our planners time. Um, sending all notices out. Um, we have to do findings of fact for a board of adjustment, which really closely align with the minutes. And so that's something that could be transitioned from the planners to an administrative assistant if we just had more time. Helping me out and posting our internship, which we post, you know, two to three times a year. Um, helping me issue and track floodplain permits gather data for quarterly reports, um, help the planners, you know, fill in resolution and ordinance templates. I know that these seem like small things, but they would really help staff out. Um, the largest item that could be accomplished if we had a full-time position would be helping us implement our public outreach toolkit. You know, making those how-to videos on applying online, um, maintaining our website, helping us do the social media posts and get those organized about our upcoming agenda items um, and setting up informational meetings for larger cases. Um, we also have some outstanding record, record keeping and archiving projects that we need to have done that we just haven't had time um, 
to accomplish without a full-time position. And then again, there's that code enforcement officer um, position that if created, I can imagine will need administrative support. Um, logistics. So we currently share office spaces um, with environmental health. Um, those office spaces are all full. So they would need to move across the hall to where their previous offices were. There's a sufficient number across the hall for current environmental health staff. That would then allow our intern and the watershed coordinator to move into the current office space. And then we'd also have an additional office for the code enforcement officer if that position was created or a conference room, which is what one of our offices was previously used for. Um, let me show you, we've been working with environmental health on what this would look like. Um, so we need to have a customer counter across the hall um, for them. We've worked with Joby and I'll talk about this in budgeting, but just so you know what it looks like, there'd need to be an opening in the wall where our current intern office is so the administrative assistant could face customers and then a new um, counter put in. Um, so budget Im implications. Since this is currently a shared position between the departments, what we're really paying for annually is an additional half of that salary and those benefits. So that totals to about twenty-two dollars to $34,000 a year, um, depending on the benefits package. I worked with Lisa Markley to figure that out. In the current fiscal year, we have sufficient funds for the next three months um, to cover the additional costs of a full-time position. Um, those office modifications would cost about $5,000 and meet a budget amendment and facilities management or potentially could be covered under the protective barrier um, program with the ARPA funds. We talked to Lisa Markley and Joby, Joby about that too. There are ongoing costs with you know, having another phone line and a printer, um, but because environmental health is not paying the benefits of a position, a full-time position, I think that those ongoing costs would already be covered under their budget. We worked with Kimberly on that. And then there are one-time fees for a new computer, phone, office equipment, and environmental health has determined that they would be able to cover about $1,800 in this amount as well in the current fiscal year budget. Um, so in summary, I really think it's going to be annually the salary and benefits that's going to increase the budget. But with the department's current workload, um, we really do have enough work for a full-time position and more projects that they could take on if it was full-time. Um, and with continued growth in that code enforcement position, I could really see the need you know, in a few months if we don't do it now. Um, and of course, if environmental health just has a part-time administrative assistant across the hall, we'd be willing to help them cover phones if no one was available in the office or they just need it back up if we had a full-time position. So we'd maintain that relationship as well. Questions? And I, I've got um, Greg's here. He's been talking to communities about the code enforcement position. Stephanie can talk to you about any duties. And then Kimberly with environmental health is here as well. Um, I have questions. So I'm just trying to figure out, right now you share your uh, position. Mm -hmm. How am I missing that you're looking at it just an additional half because environmental health would be losing their half? They're keeping their part-time position and I'm keeping my part-time position and so I need an additional equivalent of my yeah. part-time. Yeah, right. That's key. Yeah, got, got you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, That's a lot of good information. And um, I guess I'd like to hear from Kimberly as well if she would you know, to talk with us at a couple questions for you. Sure. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And maybe this first question is for both of you. Um, we have a full time position, and we're talking about a full time and a half time. So do you, what do you think about recruiting for a half-time position? Is that going to be a, in today's job market, is that going to be a tough one? It could be. I've talked to Alyssa about it. Um, 
we really just we don't know um, if how it will be to recruit for that or not. It could be tough. We might get some you know money that meets that need and stuff like that too. Um, we definitely can utilize the, the 20 hours with no problem. Uh, I know one of the things that we've talked about is even in potentially in the near future, if we end up getting a couple more grants that if we needed to go for three quarter time, that if we got that grant, it might be able to facilitate those hours if we needed to for recruitment purposes. Right now, I just don't have the numbers to justify that. Okay, so you answer, answered my second question, which was how would, how would the current half time work for you? Is that enough? You say now it is right now it is and we'd have to you know look at that if we ended up getting the, some more grants and stuff that would come in through administration and our departments work so closely together you know if, if kimberly's having trouble finding somebody and i've found a full-time position we can help out you know until they're able to fill that i don't, I don't want to create a problem for environmental health um how about the, the moving across the hallway? How would that work for you? Is that sufficient space? It is. I actually, um, staff and I, we went over and looked at things and we have a, a good idea. Matt kind of went through how it used to be set up in the past. Um, we'd be probably looking at that. The inter current intern office would be where the admin person would go, mostly because we wanted them to have some private space, not be out in a fishbowl where mm -hmm. voices would, if people were out in the hall, that would create noise and then also would bounce into our offices. So we thought having a private space where we didn't have to enter their space all the time would be good. And then it'd be Taylor and Matt. And then in the comp, that small conference area is in it where I would be. We'd have a small table out in the kind of where the file cabinets and stuff are now mm -hmm. that'll all be cleaned up. And we'd have a table so that if we needed to meet for small meetings or have a demo, we'd have that space. So it should work out really well for us. Um, we're not really um, considering the code enforcement officer at this point. No. So that's. Yeah. So you're right. We wanted to bring it up though because. Kimberly and I talked through this and having somebody split now and then creating a code enforcement officer position potentially, you know, end of the year, we don't even have office space for that person. So the split's going to have to happen and it's just a matter of, you know, do we do it now and train somebody in health duties and then who gets to keep that administrative assistant position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was more of the, the training issues of bringing someone on and training them and then, you know, maybe seven months or a year, we're back at doing this all over again and trying to find somebody to come in. Mm -hmm. And I felt even with the code and without the code enforcement position, I have enough going on to make this a full-time position. Right. Well, you've got two boards mm -hmm. that, and I know having served on one of those that there's a lot that goes into those meetings mm -hmm. and then three minutes is, is the packets. Yeah, of information. So I understand that. And I think what I'm hearing is Board of Health will have maybe settled down a little bit, you know, if the pandemic is where we're giving us a break. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, we definitely yeah. Are. And, um, I might be struggling a little bit with going from a 20 hour to a 40 hour position. Particularly when we don't know if we're going to do the code enforcement officer. And I just was thinking would 30 hour, a 30 hour position, a 20 hour position be something we could look at and then see if the code enforcement officer position comes up? It, it could be. I know it's recruiting for two part time positions that much. Might be yeah, we'd still be looking at the need for separation of spaces if we did that, just because it wouldn't be conducive to have yeah. two people working in that space. Mm -hmm. So we'd still be looking at yeah. those costs and stuff. But I, I think back to one of my initial comments was we're using over 20 hours of the position right now already. Um, I think prior to Board of Health meetings, you know, it was, and maybe Stephanie can fill this in a little bit more. It was probably close to 30 planning hours at, at some points. Um, so I, I do hesitate because I, I, it's not, we say it's a 2020 split, but I tried to get better. 
but I take up a lot of the time. Yeah. Right? And I do know, like, since I've come <laughs> on, it's like, I know we've kind of pushed that a little bit more too. Yeah. And so it's definitely, we're struggling for that even split. And so I'm going to be pushing for more of my hours and she's, you know, would have to have that. So she, yeah. Would you say it's 60, 40 right now? I have Stephanie would probably better answer that, but probably it could be. And we could, you know, utilize more things too. And we've just kind of not pushed off some of that stuff on because we know how that position gets so busy, which is crazy. So one other concern that I had, you know, asking questions, but my other concern that I had was we don't have the final spacing study yet. And I hate to say, gee, let's do this plan and then have something come up that makes us say, gee, we should, and, and there's two, there's two parts. There's the staffing part and there's the office part of what you're proposing. But I would just hate to move forward on the office part and say, yeah, that's exactly what it's going to look like and then have something come back in the, in the spacing and study that we say, gee, we wish we wouldn't have started ripping into this because mm -hmm. now we have something else. Maybe Joby has something some sense about that. Hello. Um, I know when the space needs assessment, the kind of the plan that we are going with now is the two staying combined with just increasing the rent that they take up now so moving forward is it going to be two independently operating offices if you were to approve this would be my biggest question and concern because you were kind of talking about recaption that public space anyway mm -hmm. that was kind of the i mean the tentative plan i don't have the final report i do to have that the 18th of this month but that's been the plan since we started the space needs assessment was the two were going to remain as one big office just increased square footage and part of that the location is most likely going to be the same there's just the hallway that splits the two would disappear so we could approve the staffing part i mean to, to my to my thinking having each each department having its own secretary doesn't mean there has to be a hallway between the two spaces. No. You can still co-locate. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and in fact, that gives you some, that would give you some backup. Mm -hmm. You need more mm -hmm. of backup mm -hmm. if one person is gone or to help each other. Mm -hmm. So, and so but that's the space we're looking at. So it wouldn't be, yeah, we could just. Rethink the front be, counter is basically, yeah. mm -hmm. is all we would tentatively have to do it mm -hmm. if we moved forward with two two administrative assistants. Mm -hmm. I've seen that done at other counties mm -hmm. too where two departments share but they have like a front area where mm -hmm. there are two separate people are working at. Mm -hmm. So you have coverage of different things but there's still that separation. Yeah I think we fully support that mm -hmm. that plan. Um, especially if it could get you guys some natural light across the hall. That would be good. That's, that's, the, other, <laughs> yeah. that's the other thing that if you just you know open it up more. Mm -hmm. you know. That's, I think that's all I have right now. I guess my, a couple of my questions, might be more for Alyssa, is just the, the number of positions that we currently have for a county and the length of time it's taking to fill, looking at a full-time position and then maybe a part-time position, how long do you think You'd be potentially looking at fill those positions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joey. <laughs> it's really hard, hard to tell. I mean, some positions, um, I would say most recently, we had a lot of applications for our conservation positions. Um, but not for other ones. I think location matters. I think hours, you know, we did talk about the halftime in the past. They've been difficult to fill. It might not be the same now. There might be somebody that doesn't want to work full time. I mean, people have shifted their, um, what they want to do, how many hours things have really changed in, in that arena. Um, it, I think both are going to be somewhat difficult to fill, to be honest. I, I, we've had an admin assistant. I think, Carly, yours is the most recent one. 
and it took a little bit to get filled, I think. I mean, we have, we're having good applicants. We're just not getting the numbers like we used to. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if the length will be much longer. I, I, I think you'll have applications for the full time, definitely. The half time is my question. It's been a while since we've recruited for a half time position. You know, if somebody's not looking for benefits, if they want, you know, to come in halfway through the morning, leave early in the afternoon, you know, we've, we've had those individuals that really want to just be half time in the past. Um, but I know they have, they have also been somewhat difficult for certain departments to fill. So it would potentially be more challenging if we said, well, let's split them. And keep two, two half, -time. half time and just gauge how we, much work there is on we, both sides. I believe so. We we did that, and I'm going to turn to Carla again. I'm trying to remember. You had two half time positions at one point in community services. We did, and it was difficult. Yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we had just one half time position, we were fortunate. We had an employee in that position for like 20 years, mm -hmm. I believe. And you got to find the right person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, we could find it now. I mean, I don't, we have, like I said, we haven't recruited for a half tech position. I'm not sure I've ever recruited since the, they put the full time in community services. Um, so it's been quite a while. I mean, I want to be optimistic and, and you know, think we'll, we'll get some applicants. Uh, I just know things have really, they've been a little more difficult recently. But yeah. I wouldn't want to see it grow into two full-time positions because we could not have part-time. Yeah, right. correct. Right. 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 I, I would recommend if you, if you if you approve this or however you want to split it, whether it's three quarters, half or whatever, if we don't get that, we'll just, I would recommend coming, regrouping, coming back, um, trying to figure out what, what we could do for recruitment purposes. Again, I really hope it, we have no issues. I think it just depends. And I know that like, um, Amelia, you there was several things on here that you want to gear up to. It'll probably take some time. Mm -hmm. I guess um, the position right now, how it's set up, is that an adequate amount? I guess of staffing that you have that you, that you both have for the, what you're doing right now. Again, I get what you're mm -hmm. where you're to wanting do. to go, what you're wanting to do, where you're wanting to go. It is. Um, because I have the planners and myself do a lot of administrative tasks. So we don't always have time for work program items or other things, but yeah. Stephanie, did you want to you unless you have some specific questions? What if, yeah, because I mean, because you're the one who's been doing the job that we're talking about right, right now. So, um, talk to us a little bit about how your time was split before, right? And so definitely Amelia is correct that my time <clears throat> did take up, planning did take up more of my time than environmental health, for sure. Um, I don't know that I had enough duties that I was currently doing to be full-time, um, but she did have a pretty lengthy list of extra duties mm -hmm. that she wants to add to that position. I'm not sure what else. I know the planners were doing, like taking care of notifications. They yeah. started, because I used to do all of that. Right. And then when you started doing more board of health stuff, we kind of took back the notifications, stuff in right. the envelopes. I've gotten really good at stuffing them and watching Netflix. <laughs> um, let's see. And then you guys, they just kind of kept that. Yeah. It just simple things like, after I do a floodplain permit review, if I could kick it to an administrative assistant to create the actual permit, that would save me so much time. Mm -hmm. And I used to do that before we yeah. had citizen serve. Mm -hmm. I issued all the permits. 
so and be, when has citizen zero changed? It makes it, it automatically generates the permit, but somebody has to check it over. And then there's tracking involved that I'd like an admin assistant to have time to do to say, your floodplain permit's gonna expire in a month. And that's something the planners currently do for zoning permits. So those expire after six months. So something Marcus is working on today is notifying everyone who, who um, expires in 45 days. And so that's another thing that, you know, is probably going to take about four hours of Marcus's time today and something that we could have an administrative assistant do if that position is full time. So I guess based on Stephanie's or your comment, Stephanie's comment there, the, the program or whatever, is it that she didn't have access? I mean, did you have to be a planner to have access or it just didn't we just get bumped? We just, get bumped back over we, we just decided not to bump it back over to her on some of those things, just so we can be a little bit more conscious of how much time we were using. No citizen serve, so I'm sorry. It does, so citizen serve does not have a tool in it where it will, it can track? No, it does. It's just somebody has to run the report and then send emails to everybody individually that, that comes up on that report. Oh, I gotcha. So it's a okay. little bit time consuming. I mean, it's way better than what we used to have, you know, paper permits that you have to look <laughs> through. So. Um, so isn't there legislation working its way through that counties can't, cities and counties can't have their own um, code? That's a building code. That's a building code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the code enforcement position would be more like property maintenance, okay. um, junk vehicle issues. Building code's also on our work program. Um, and I think the legislation is that we can have a building code, but it has to make, match the state building code. So we can't go past the adopted state building code in terms of green building requirements uh -huh. or other things. So we could still have a local one that we enforce. It's still, in, would there could still be enforcement yes. there. It's just that it would be, which is better than what we have now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're the only folks that can say that though. <laughs> Personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if we want to hear from Greg or not. He's here. I'm here anyway, so you can ask me any questions or not. It might be that that we're really not looking into code enforcement. I mean, I'm interested in it, but we're really, it's really not the thing that's going to to make this make our decision on this one or not. Right. So we could catch up on that later, is what I was thinking. Okay. Is that okay? That's right. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So what I'm what I'm hearing is that you're uh, there's enough work that you expect to be able to hand off to a full-time person. Mm -hmm. Um The fact that you have nobody in that spot right now, um, and the the work and the time it takes to train that person to do everything, um, I understand why you're bringing this forward right now because it, timing wise seems to make better sense as far as training and hiring. Um, I feel like there's still some gray as far as if that if that full-time position would actually have enough 
for full time. Um, or not, but I understand why you're bringing it forward right now. Our question, even though we're not talking about it right now, board enforcement officer, start talking about with the with the intent there that the communities would contract with us for it and we would we would not be using county funds for that it'd be similar to what we do with county control and what we do with contract law enforcement yes except our department would also use that position so i think we'd have to do we contract with ourselves or pay into it for our share Would you like me just to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm just trying to look at yeah if we do, you know, our likelihood of doing that and that it would apply to some of the systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the current format is to have a split local community and a county position on the funding side. Um, the concerns I'm hearing out in the county have been twofold. One is that there is a backlog of things they just cannot deal with. And the second thing is the potential for future growth. Um, Colo's looking at a housing development. Uh, Maxwell's looking at the, the recent Casey's issue that they're dealing with. Zering just had a building collapse last year. These are things that the communities are really starting to take a look at and they are gonna be tackling these over the next six months, which is another reason Amelia is bringing this forward now. This discussion on this position might not be right now immediate, but it is going to be needing time for training and, and getting fully going because when it does finally hit, these communities are going to be needing this position um, and hit the ground running. Um, I just kicked and I was at the property over there by Zeri. Mm -hmm. That was a prime case of example where I had a, a community outreach person for that for nuisance property, which ended up being in the county. Well, that was back and forth with me and Amelia and me taking up her time with that, but this position could take that up instead which is a better use of county resources in my opinion as well. So that is another prime example of why we're, this is under discussion. And so far the community outreach has been, they, they see a need, but there's still a lot of work to do in the meantime over the next six months. You're welcome, we're still meeting tomorrow, right? Yes. Okay, just check it. You had something else you wanted to talk to me about. Yes, I did. So and we think there's for sure seven communities that are interested, right? Yes. So seven communities. Um that was going to be counting up in my report in April for the supervisor's update. Um the, the thing that I am facing with my outreach is there's been a lot of turnover in city councils mm -hmm. um this past election yeah. cycle. So it's uh, it's it's a learning curve. There's no doubt about it as elected officials who understand that. So there's bringing up to speed on what's going on, what they were working on, and then what they wanted to forward with. So and they're interested to the point that they would be willing to kick in some money to help support the position. Different varying degrees, absolutely. Um, the problem is, is that right now Zering is dealing with like water main breaks. Maxwell's got the Casey's burn situation. Um, Colo's with the housing development. I mean, these are things that they have as a top priority, but this is absolutely on the radar. So these discussions, it's going to be if the county's interested, we're interested. If the county doesn't have time to spend on this, then we have better things we need to focus on in our part-time situations with elected officials. Thanks. Thank you. Administrative assistant one position. There isn't one anymore. 
And I'm not super familiar with the job, the old job description of the ones, but I think they're both, they were both twos at some point because of the board staffing. So the one is just discontinued, it's gone. No, we still have it. There's just, just nobody's in the it's there. still there. Mm -hmm. The permitting is the piece with the two. If you want to have them do the permitting, the different pieces like that, that makes yeah. them happen too. Okay. There's some budgeting things. There's some other, other, it just, all admins have all duties of a one and then they fill. And so we reclassify them. But they've been choose for as long as I can remember. So maybe a bad idea to work on an administrative assistant too that does all the board work for both agencies and does the permitting and a one position that does um, some less sophisticated duties. We could do that. It just still require like a reconfiguration of our space. Because we're out of room. And I know like our person, like she said, permitting and stuff, we would have some assistance with the permitting as well as the board minutes and different things like that. So there is some crossover that way if the permitting comes into play for the admin too. I think it, I don't know that that probably falls into her, most of our stuff that falls under the permitting and the board. So most of what she needs is their to duties. Work. Yeah. Would it be helpful for me to go through exactly what I see putting on a full-time position? Or it's on page two of the memo. Um, we kind of already talked about increasing review of permits when they come in to make sure they're correct before we take funds. Mm -hmm. So the planner's not doing that. Um, conceptual review and interagency review materials. So right now the planners let other departments know there's an application out there on CitizenServe for them to look at and comment on. But, you know, for instance, City of Ames has an admin assistant that sends those emails and tracks to see who hasn't made comments by the deadline and that kind of thing. Um, general tracking of development cases and following up again with applicants when they don't get back to us. Um, notices, I already talked about resolutions and ordinances and taking on findings of fact, which is something the planners currently do and is really duplicating the minutes. Um, Helping with posting the internship, um, gathering data for the quarterly reports, helping with floodplain permitting, and then those public outreach toolkit items, um, including maintaining like a current project page on our website, um, doing more social media posts with information from the planners and what cases they're working on, and helping set up public informational meetings. And then those other record keeping projects. So we have development case files on our shared drive that we haven't archived since 2015 because we just haven't had staff resources to do it. We had an intern take on one year of those and it took you know, on and off throughout the entire summer to get one year done. Um, it's a lot, but we've got to get those in CitizenServe. And, and CitizenServe has made it way easier to upload um, information now, so we don't have the problem with current development cases, but we still have six years that need to be archived. Um, we also have an external hard drive that doesn't back up information off a computer. It just has all this historic case information and historic maps and zoning regulations on it. And the hard drive's 10 years old, and we need to go through it and get it somewhere that's backed up. Um, these, these have been on my list since like 2017. <laughs> so um, let's see. And then the code enforcement, if that happens. What, what percentage of that code enforcement position would you have in other work and would it be? Oh, that's a good question. 
Um, I asked the communities how many code enforcement cases they had, and they, they've had so much turnover that no one really could track it, uh, unfortunately. But just based on size, you know, we're larger, we've got 10,000 people in the unincorporated area, which is larger than the city of Nevada. So I'd say 20%. So you're saying that 20% of the time you can track unincorporated area code enforcement mm -hmm. and the other 80% would, so that's new work we don't currently have. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. Okay. Was you're going to be recouping some planner time mm -hmm. for each of planners by moving the administrative stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, what were you doing? Okay, so it would be fully quote enforcement. The county would be paying a percentage because a percentage of its cases would be in the unincorporated. Yes. I'd assume each of the communities, communities participating would probably be around 10%. With the remaining 80% of that position's time. Yeah. Okay. That, that answers. Okay. Yeah. I had the aspect, so I was just thinking, you know, what else will that person be doing? Mm -hmm. You gave us a lot of information, but we still have a few questions. No. <laughs> so that's good. Um, so uh, let's say for just the sake of argument that um, we went with the full time and half time mm -hmm. and we were able to get someone into the full time position pretty quickly, but then the half-time position takes many more months to fill. Would the expectation be that this full-time position would be taking over the duties that that half-time position would be taking? And would that person then end up need to, needing to be trained on all those things? That I think I would maybe could at least help with some of the yeah. things like coverage and maybe some some of the more like I'm gonna say simple things that you know claims or things like that, that maybe but yeah some if not that. we'll incorporate that in and until we're able to find it. It's given me the opportunity. I mean since I've only been here a few months. So it's now I've had the opportunity to see kind of the things that Stephanie does and that'll help me when I go to train them in person too. So to understand those things better and things like that. So yeah. there's definitely a lot more on the back end of citizen serve that I had no clue about. Yeah. And uh, I've been fumbling through. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think you're right when we talk about, you know, hopefully, environmental thing because it's from the COVID team, kind of gets down in the volume of meetings that we were having. Mm -hmm. Did they know Stephanie was the secretary for that 2000 minutes? So, kind of what's what's the plan there in the mean, would be in the meantime? Would it be if there was this new position, would it be? That they're going to be implementing you and them, or I'm just saying, if there was a, as like you said, what if that full time position yeah. was coming but the part time wasn't? I guess that I was envisioning, you know, we could do phone calls, we could help customers at the counter still, and then we would try claims. to incorporate as much in, as we can, yeah, and stuff like that. But certain home. things that you do, like the grants to counties program for yeah. wells, I, I don't think I'd want. To train a full-time person on yeah. that program for instance no the amount of time that it would take to to mm -hmm. train them and do that stuff i think it'd be simpler for us to end up trying to handle that mm -hmm. and if, if somebody needed you know at board of health i think who's going to do the minutes and right now matt um you? well he runs the things that we've had discussions on that yeah. it'll be one of our staff or you know one of the board members but most likely it'll okay. be like me or Taylor. yeah I guess yeah. I'd be comfortable with like the full-time position if you needed somebody to you know do the roll call vote and write down who made the motions but the minutes do take a lot of time mm -hmm. yeah and I did minutes at my previous job for the board there so it's so I have experience with that okay. so I can help them do it
I mean, as I guess we won't, we won't know. Hopefully, like we said, the recruitment goes positive. Yeah. But, so that we just don't know until it's done. So mm -hmm. yeah, send the positive thoughts out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> we could hold off on the taking that wall out until after recruitment, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, what's really interesting is it's figure one and your zoning permits issue. What percentage of that? Yeah, um, I don't know if that, that's not your total workload, the office, no. but it's a lot of it. Yep. And I'm noticing you take 2011 through 2015, you average those five. That's not what it is. I think I averaged 2016 in with the first half and the second half. Yeah. And I got, let's see, 145 for 2016 through 2021 average, and 2011 through 2016 was 115. So yeah. just 30 per, it's 30 permits more on average, just in the second half of this time period. Yeah. Um, I know we've been talking about steering growth towards cities a lot recently, and I, I just wanted to point out that most of these are not for houses. I think in the second half of the time period, we've really seen an increase in solar permits, which has been a very interesting. Um, I think at one point we had more solar permits than garages one quarter. <laughs> um, and then we've had a lot of increase in accessory buildings. So especially in 2020, when we had 147 permits, I could not believe the number of accessory structures that people were putting up at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not all houses from yeah. developments. But there are still comments. Oh, I sure. Just, I just saw an option notice come up that was really, um, yeah, really kind of advertising yeah. a um, a piece of land that was about 80 acres as building potential. For one house. For one house. For one. Well, you could, <laughs> I don't know if you could divide that one, but I, but I, but I see more of that out in the unincorporated yeah. areas. You know, not just big developments, but lots of, okay, you could build a house on this land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I did feel pretty comfortable being able to project then that permitting trend, which is what you see in figure two. Okay. Um, it's, it's a pretty good line fit. I mean, it's not super strong, but it was strong enough for me um, in terms of the R squared. But, you know, I think we're going to get up to around 163. 160 permits here in the next couple of years, which would be, you know, 40 to 50 more permits a year than we'd been experiencing when we just had a shared position. One thing I really wanted to see was that you felt like this proposal would work for both of your departments. And you've obviously been doing a lot of talking about it. Yeah. yeah. We feel pretty positive about it and had, had some good talks on if it should all work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would honestly have an expectation out of it that if you did the full time administrative assistant planning and development, that you would be able to shift enough work to that person and that that was appropriately classified that you other than the code enforcement who chose to do that your two planning staff plus yourself and your interns that's sufficient for your growth i think so yeah um with the only exception being you know if cities in the future need actual planning services not code enforcement but planning services that would probably be another shared a lot of little cities contract with an engineering firm for those right now. And I can see if they like the code enforcement model. They're trying to bring in new development. You know, that, yeah. That's the kind of thing. I think it's why I like code enforcement. It makes a lot of sense because if you're a smaller community, you're not going to develop all the expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, all these little communities aren't going to develop the expertise that they need to just sustain where they are, much less, you know, grow. So I think it's I think it's a good model yeah. for if, you know if if it's something that's mm -hmm. we're able to do and make work and everybody's kind of make it work and everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. I think it's 
something that county government can provide in terms of expertise to the school. So I'm, I'm, yeah. And I think, you know, there's discussion about, you know, a housing planner with the Des Moines MPO to help implement the housing mm -hmm. study for a few years and if that position transferred into something in our department that cities you know fund it that would be how i would see the department growing but in terms of unincorporated growth i think you know that's something that we are really reassessing and so current staffing levels should yeah, be sufficient and, and how your ordinance works consistent with that I mean, yeah we, we don't reassess that without saying these are this is the deal yeah this is how I don't have any other questions. I think um, if I just could add one more thing, I think you make um, I think you make a really good case for what we're wanting to shift over to uh, to the admin assistant position, um, and I do think it's important that we look at where you're spending your time, your planners are spending their time. Um, I appreciate that you put so much work and thought into um, putting this together too. Thanks. I have a motion. I, I would certainly entertain a motion. I'm just interested in the because I can't remember who turned it. I'm no longer my turn. I'll put up this motion um, that uh, I move that we approve the request for a full time administrative assistant to the position for the planning and development. Second. 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 Um, moving on to discussion and consideration to appoint a designated community services program coordinator as general assistant director. Good morning. Okay. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> um, so back here to visit with you today some more about the general assistance director designation. We talked about this during the community services budget work session. Um, at that time, we had kind of thrown out there, or I threw out there some three different options I presented to, and then I brought one up at the meeting. Um, one of the options being appointing the community services program coordinator as a GA director um, by Iowa Code Chapter 252.26. The Board of Supervisors is responsible to appoint or designate a GA director. Uh, so then the, the second option there was to look at entering into a 2080 agreement with CICS as the employer of record for a percentage of staff time to perform the GA responsibilities. Um, currently, I am performing those responsibilities through the community services director job description. My time is split right now 95% CICS and 5% county. Um, and then the third option there was to look at increasing the GA director responsibilities to a full-time position within the county. I did um, think about all of these options quite a bit, and I visited with Sandra um, several times on this as well. Um, and what I've arrived at at this point in time would be to make a recommendation to the board to appoint the community services program director. Um, as the GA director or designate that within that job description. Um, when I did do time studies and my time ranged anywhere from 4% to about 8.75% 8 doing the GA director responsibilities and county related work. So Erin and I have talked about it. Uh, she does think that picking up those responsibilities is doable within her current work. We're starting to balance out with our workloads when we hired on the second general assistant service coordinator. So that is 
um, and not needing to take on as many GA appointments as she was needing to do um, earlier in the year and last year. I'm happy to talk about any of those options with you if you have questions. Or would you like more information? Carla, you'd be looking at this potentially being accepted July 1. Yes. Yep. Yep. We would need to update the general assistance manual if you were to go forward with this. I know that we would need to do that. And I also believe I think we need to update the ordinance. It's been a while since I've looked at that, but I think that's going to need updated up also. So would that change then shift your uh, work to 100% CICS then? It would, yep. It moved me fully over to CICS with Franklin being my employer of record. Aaron, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, no, no. Okay. I do have one question for you. Sure. I know you've been involved in this, you've been working in UC. Yes. You did quite a bit, I think, during the pandemic and maybe some during the ratio. Would you be able to continue doing that, being part of the EOC team with the addition of these hours? You're asking me this right after we had a close tornado. <laughs> 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 because I was at home going, no, no. Um, yes. I mean, I think the training for it and stuff like that is, um, you know, pretty minimal. You know, it, it's and they, they've gotten pretty consistent with it, you know, so it's a few times a year and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, I think the advantage of me being a part of that is probably also that I live here in Nevada and I can get there quickly and, and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, we'd be kind of thin um, for mm -hmm. sure, but depending on, you know, how long the the need was or whatever. And they and the EOC does a nice job. I mean, if if I couldn't have spared the time, you know what I mean? It, I think that, you know, if you can only be in there half the day, you know, and then you gotta go back to your regular work, you know, it it can be done. So well, I know that the majority of the people who volunteer to, you know, when we need that, you know, that done with the EOC are county employees right now. Yes. And I did speak with Keith a little bit when we're talking about CICS and some people would be going from county county employment to being you know, CICS employees with Franklin being a county record. I like just said you know, you might lose some people that you've been relying on. And Keith and I have been talking a little bit about this as well. Uh, and we did do some research, CICS did uh, with DHS to see if we could still participate in the EOC. Uh, and DHS thought as long as it's considered incidental time, that that would be okay. Um, if it became like where there was a large event and we were spending significant time, then maybe we need to talk about that. Perhaps there'd need to be a reimbursement back from the county to CICS for that staff time. And I think it kind of depends too on what the event is, because if it's mental health related and, and the CICS staff are in there performing those responsibilities, I, to me, it doesn't make sense that the county would need to pay for that. But like some of the incidences have been working on child care issues and that kind of thing, which probably doesn't really fall in the realm of CICS work. But um, so I think it would kind of depend. But for incidental time, the information we got back was that would be okay. Good. Glad to know there's some flexibility there because that was a concern that I had because I just see how many people we have during during our, our last two emergencies who were county employees and where they came from. And I thought, yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you. And I know you yeah. can't predict exactly where all this is going, but that gives me a little bit of assurance. So. Sounds good. Sure. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I would move that we appoint or designate a 
appoint and designate, I would think, the community service program director as a general assistance director for Iowa Co Chapter 252.26, effective 7 1 and direct staff to make all necessary changes. Second. Seconded. Working. Aye. Evans. Aye. Basil. Aye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Aye. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have consideration of updated financial policies. Seven-day review. Good morning, board. Good morning. Uh, I bring before you today the most recent um, revision to the Story County financial policies. So uh, the additions are the two appendices that are at the back, they're labeled draft. It's appendix A and appendix B. And this is to codify some internal controls of ours and uh, our uh, accrual guidelines. Uh, this is based on conversations we have with the state auditor during our FY20 audit. Um, these are all things that we have done internally, but they like to see a written policy in place. Um, so I sat down with Assistant Auditor Lisa Markley and we worked through the guidance that she'd given verbally and in emails to departments and offices about um, accruals. Um, and that's just What the, what the state auditors like to see. And, and also as part of our financial policies, we always look at our internal controls and try to improve them. So um, that's what makes sense. Um, I don't know if you had any questions, but those are the two appendix A and then appendix B are what are added. We, we reviewed the rest of the policy and are not making any revisions at this time. We did uh, particularly look at the mental health portion, which we had the financial policies are pretty uh, overarching. We have a lot of specific related policies like our capital assets policy and our purchasing and procurement policy and our credit card policy. Um, but these are more overarching financial and accounting uh, statements that we make about how to properly run Story County. So we left those as is for now. But this is subject to seven day review if anyone has. So, and you said these these are all things that are you're already doing. Or yeah, we're just codifying those in a written policy. Um, when you when you when you tell auditors this is how we do things, they you know <laughs> they'd like to see uh, something that you that says this is how you and, do and not just like well this is this is the handout I gave at the DHEO meeting or this is the email I sent or this is the conversation I had with Artie. So um, I mean all these things are happening. It's just a way of putting it down in black and white. Makes sense to me. Okay. I make a motion to approve the updated financial policy subject to the seven day second. Okay. Thank you. I'll bring back the final the next week. Okay. Next, we have discussion and consideration of holding an I Love My County Because Art Contest in conjunction with NACO and National County Government Month. So um, I'm bringing this forward um, just because NACO is um, holding a contest asking for school age children um, to submit artwork and, and a, an I Love My County statement. Um, and then uh, winners will be selected to be in the, the NACO uh, camp calendar that they issue with that artwork. And I thought it would be a great way to reach out to our local communities and ask them to participate in that contest. But then anything they submit, they could submit here as well. And then we could display their art in different county buildings, it could be on the website, just a way to get um, <coughs> get our kids and our families involved in Story County and showcase showcase their work. So just unclear. So this is something that may go. So could they submit it directly to a link through NACO and yes. then they would also do the yes so my, my so there was a confusion that mm -hmm. they should do the 
do both. So. Right. So my my thought was we have a link to the NACO submission page. Um, and also, so the page that would have the information about the contest would have a submit button or a way for them to upload their artwork to us, but then make it clear that you would click this link to get to the national contest. So it would be two separate submissions. It would be two separate links together. Yeah, it would be two separate submissions. And I thought I thought about us taking the submission, but then I don't I don't want us to be responsible for right getting right. their submission and their parental permissions and all of that. So um, I don't know what I mean. Like the only any question, how easy is it to have a button to do something like that? Would it be something to say, don't forget to also submit to? Yeah, yeah, I just think then, you know, I hate for somebody to think, oh, what's the point? I'm submitting to the national, but they pray right. they they did they didn't they forgot about it. So. Right. And then, um, you know, but it would also involve uh, finding some way to display the art. And then having permission to post them around at different art buildings. So NACO wants the original artwork mailed to them. No, you can upload it as well. Please mail original artwork to NACO at 660 North Capitol Street, Northwest. I mean, it's a good idea. I like it too. I, I, I think you brought up a good question is to be clear as clear as they submit it. So <coughs> so my motion. Sure. Okay, I would move that we hold the not well to my county because our contest in conjunction with NACO and National County Government Okay. Okay. Um, right. Aye. 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 Thank you. Moving on to departmental reports. Nothing for departmental reports, other reports, upcoming agenda items. Hmm. Okay, now it's time for public comment number two comments from the public on items not on this agenda. The board may not take action on the comments due to requirements for open meetings law, but may do so in the future. Anyone who'd like to make a comment, you can raise your hand on Zoom or step forward to the table. Seeing no one was public comment number two. Liaison assignments, committee meeting updates, and announcements from the supervisors. Uh, Supervisor Higgins, would you like to go first? Um, sure, we've got the work session this afternoon. I have a work meeting tonight. Um, I meet tomorrow morning with um, Ed Union Way, who we have the sheriff's office. Um, my calendar, and then Thursday and Friday, I have down to the ISAC conference. I am holding. That Diane Boss from Ames has been on an email uh, to all of us with the availability for either Monday the 14th, Wednesday the 16th, or Monday the 21st of a conference board meeting for a recommendation from the uh, court group or assessor. So it's something that she just mentioned if you haven't had a chance to respond to that, you know, she'd like to hear back. So we didn't really enough to get a, a date on the calendar. The 16th, so it's uh, yeah, Monday, Wednesday, or Monday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, and I, I did tell them that when we were talking about it, that we had, we had a county public hearing that mm -hmm. that did not work for us. So. Session this afternoon, get Jim there. And 
estimating tomorrow morning uh, in Ames and then I'll have the Sheriff's Office recognition. And I said Thursday and Friday also, and uh, nothing Monday except the Constitution Assessor. I might have a WMA meeting, I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 That's about it. Yeah. I'd like to the same, um, except uh, tomorrow I have Story County College Access Network um, meeting, and then meeting uh, with uh, Henry Foreman just to talk about his idea about the uh, Pioneer Cemeteries. That there are lots of conversations happening around childcare right now, both with um, Boost and SCAN. Boost director brought forward um, a pilot idea that uh, Waterloo is doing with their UCI, um, working with the, the high school students and local child care providers to um, provide training and um, an opportunity for them to receive some income while they're earning credit. Um, and then there's another, there's a child care conversation that will be happening in Roland. It, it was supposed to be Thursday, but it's getting rescheduled um, just to address some of the issues that Roland is having um, with child care in that community. So I'll keep you posted on that. Okay. So it's like now we need to move into closed session. Pursuant to code section, Iowa code section 21.5 sub one. I make a motion that we move into closed session pursuant to Iowa code section 21.5 sub one. Second. Moved and seconded. Headed. Aye. Okay. Aye. Case law, aye. Yeah, closed session. Okay, we will reconvene from. Uh, Closed session at 108. Do I have a motion to approve the evaluation as discussed? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Merkin. Aye. Edmonds. Aye. Faisal. Aye. I move that we adjourn. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Edmonds. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Faisal. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.